This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. My subject is Malcolm J. Brenner. He is a writer and he has led one of the more unusual American lives that you might find out there. Uh, my conversation with him will begin in a moment. Malcolm J. Brenner is my guest. He is a writer. He has written several books about his life and experiences. And I find it to be one of the more interesting uh, lives that I've come across, uh, American or otherwise. So welcome, Malcolm. I'd like to just get right into it and start sort of chronologically about who you are, where you come from. You were born in 1951. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your background, your family background, your mother, your father, where you came from, where you grew up? Well, my parents met and married in London during World War II. My father was a... Uh, a GI whose uh, job was keeping radar sets running, who was an engineer. And my mother was a nurse in the Royal Air Force. And uh, apparently, uh, they both were on the rebound from other things, from other relationships. And they met, and my father said uh, to her, uh, Will you come to America with me? And she said, Oh, if you can get me out of the Royal Air Force, sure. Three days later, she was on a boat on her way to America with her head spinning because he'd done it. That was their courtship. <laughs> now there's some real there's some real dark shit in my family background. My father was a pretty in fact he was he was better than average because I've been to a lot of men's groups where men come in and they all have the same complaint. They all say, My dad came home from the office of the factory and he never talked to me. And, just sit down in front of the TV set or read the paper and drink a beer or never did anything with me. My dad was really, he came home from work and he changed his clothes and had a martini. And then he'd go outside and play ball or he'd throw football around or he'd go swimming in the family pool, you know. We lived a really nice middle class life on the outside. My mother, what? She had an awful childhood. Awful childhood. And I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't wish it on her anyway. Um, her father uh, was a hard hat diver. I guess he died uh, when she was five, which would have been uh, 21 or 22. Um, and she was orphaned by the age of eight. And uh, her three sisters tried to raise her. They couldn't, and they put her in a monastery uh, with nuns who had her until she was 13, and uh, then at that point, uh, she escaped and uh, ran off and uh, made a living uh, washing floors, which was preferable to being in the monastery. But what happened to her in her very early infancy was horrible. An older brother came home from the sea and raped her as an infant. Now that's that's, and she, I, I didn't hear that from her. I heard that from my older sister many years after she had died. Mm -hmm. So that family story is a very dark one. No, nobody ever trusted the guy after that. I mean, you know. Uh, but um, my father also suffered some type of abuse at the hands of his mother, who, uh, following the recommended medical practice of the time, I guess, gave him a bunch of animals when he was a little kid. Animals, you know, they really hurt. They're like, you know. Uh, in fact, that's how I caught on to the fact that I had been molested. I had a barrier that I'm not check for a, 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 tumor, a, a tumor in my colon. And it hurt so much. I had to, I had to ask, ask the staff for a wash rag to wipe down on in my mouth. Otherwise, I couldn't take the pain. And I asked them afterwards, is that normal? And they said, no. Those ones were that one. And uh, the really weird thing about my family is, and this gets into what I'm talking about and growing up in the organ box, secrets of the right of childhood, is that they believed in something that didn't exist. They believed in this organ energy which was a fantasy, a narcissistic fantasy of Wilhelm Reich, this crazy Austrian 
Nikolaus Freudian psychiatrist who thought he had discovered this stuff in the inner, in, in, in the mid-30s. He made a uh, made a fucking career out of it. So except it's nothing there. I mean, his machines run on nothing. You don't plug them in, there's no batteries. They draw orgone energy from the Earth's atmospheric envelope. And uh, there is there is something wrong with their physics that a, a smart nine-year-old could tell you, you know. There's just no power coming into them, and there's no power going out of them. They don't do anything. So they maybe build up a little bit of a static charge. Uh, but they ended up, because I had a difficult birth, the birth that nearly killed my mother, uh, they ended up sending me to a right hand organist to be treated for uh, the tensions resulting the muscular tensions left over from this birth, which were supposed to affect me all through my life. And uh, even I was a sufficient pedophile. I know this because I've talked to other people who have uh, had therapy with him. They all tell me the same story. And I've talked to my brother, who's also an organist, but not in that way, not in that school. And uh, he met someone who had taken the patients from this guy, Dr. Duval was his name, Dr. Albert Duval. They had taken Duval's patients when he died, and almost all of them reported all kinds of psychiatric abuse, both, both adult and pediatric patients. The guy was, he was just a horrible person after, after, after Hitler and before uh, Paul Pot, you know. Uh, it's amazing I've ended up with as much intact up here as I have. So my parents um, had a rocky relationship. Uh, I think my mother arrived over here. My grandmother sort of thought she was going to play nursemaid to my grandfather. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, and. Uh, it looked nice, and it was a middle-class childhood, very much middle-class 1960s, but I was just a terribly upset child, and my parents did not figure out why. They had, I told them. I told them why not what happened. They didn't believe me. You see, belief is the key to everything. I don't like to believe stuff. A lot of, I was screwed for the first 30 years of my life in this stupid system. And uh, I'd much rather know, and if I don't know, I'm willing to admit I don't know. I don't need to make up beliefs that match the uh, defects in my mind. So that was, that was my year. You mentioned siblings. How many siblings do you have? And are they older or younger? I have an older sister and a younger brother. So I'm, at this, now I'm in the no. Yeah, uh, you, it was, Malcolm is not a name that's common in America, really. I, I figured there was probably something with the British. So uh, what involvement did your parents have with the organ box? Did they just buy one? Uh, the reason I ask is because I, in one of my novels I wrote, I have a, a mafia boss in the 1960s who sits in an organ box. And there was, the organ was sort of like pyramid power before pyramids. Right. With about as much justification, too. Mm -hmm. They they got into organ, I think, because it's basically the cult of the orgasm. Mm -hmm. Your mental and physical health as a human being can be determined by the type and intensity of orgasms that you have. That's the right in belief. And uh, my mother couldn't have orgasms as a result of her rape. And uh, thus, it seemed very attractive to her. Uh, I guess she thought maybe she could get back what she'd lost or something. I, I don't think it did her a damn bit of good. She was a very imperfect person before she went into therapy, and she was a very imperfect person when she came out of therapy. The difference was we were thousands of dollars poor. Was she a... Uh... 
was she uh, abusive to you or your siblings? I think she was more abusive to me. My sister uh, was a girl. I think my mother was definitely had a thing against that. And my brother was the baby of the family. But being the middle child and a male, I think I think my mother really used me as a surrogate for a lot of things she wanted to do in life. And I resisted if I wanted to be my own person. I didn't want to be her with the penis. But uh, we had this conflict going on. She turned me into a weapon against my father, too, after they divorced. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really hurt me. I didn't know how much it hurt me until years after my life. She very deliberately and very consciously turned me into a weapon to use against him, giving me pain. Did you live with her or him? I lived with her. It seemed like he was at fault. I didn't understand. I was 16. Let me talk about your schooling and growing up with uh, other children then. Uh, uh, what schools did you go to? Were, were you going to middle class, you know, Archie Andrews type high school? Or were you a, a popular child? Or were you uh, off in your own little world? I was the guy that bullies picked on or tried to pick on. Because when they pushed me far enough, the fist would fly and they'd always be surprised. They got that kind of a response from me. I have PTSD, I think, as a result of having been bullied in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade by a clique of kids uh, who had all not been going together since, since kindergarten. And uh, they didn't find anything to bully you about, you know, the way you pronounce a word, if you have a, a British pronunciation instead of an American one, because the mom's British, you know, they'll make fun of that. If you have brown eyes instead of blue eyes, they'll make fun of that. He was on the end So I hope they all got killed in Vietnam, frankly. I didn't. I pulled a high draft number. I pulled a draft number in the uh, 300s, which probably meant I would be drafted shortly before hell froze up or if we bombed up, you know, something up. Anyway. I went to New College of Florida, which was really right up the street in Sarasota. My mother moved to Sarasota when she kidnapped the two of us, me and my brother, and took us down here. And I went with her because, as I said, I blamed the father for the divorce at that time. I didn't understand that she was a frigid woman and had nothing to offer any man. And, uh, uh, I went to Riverview High School. Let me tell you about Riverview High School, okay? My senior year, they had painted yellow lines outside the doors of the cafeteria. And during your lunch period, you were not allowed to go outside those yellow lines where they go on your permanent record. The next year, the Army could grab your ass and send you to Nam, where you'd be waiting through a white rice patty carrying an M16, smoking a bit of jam, and waiting for the Viet Cong to blow you away. But you couldn't go outside those goddamn lines at the lunchroom at lunch at, at time. That was, that was my high school. I wasn't a good student. I was too distracted by the social problems I was having. Uh, I went to the problem with a girl and had a wonderful time. I can't remember her name. So you grew, uh, looking on your Wikipedia page, you were born in New Jersey and then your family moved to Florida then, or you, you just your mother? Well, you we, uh, now, so we're in New Jersey, we lived there until I was about nine, they moved to uh, Radnor, Pennsylvania, which is uh, outside of Philadelphia, Wayne, Radnor, you know, the Prussia area, it's mm -hmm. pretty famous now. Uh, my dad had a house built there, we lived there uh, for six years, I guess, and uh, and then my family fell apart. And uh, my mother, as I said, basically took us and uh, headed south. Uh, she had friends in Sarasota. She had uh, my father's uncle and aunt, who she thought would be sympathetic to her. And uh, 
we reestablished ourselves down here. And that's how I ended up going to New College, which was in Sarasota. I was offered a full scholarship to Cornell based on my SATs. And my mother said, Oh, you don't have to take that. Here. You, should, you should do what you want. You should go to New College in Sarasota, and it's going to cost you five or ten thousand dollars a year. Let's do that. So I went to New College, even though they didn't have a film program. I wanted to be a filmmaker. Uh, supposedly, you could write your uh, own um, uh, write your own program at New College, making independent study projects and arranging with local filmmakers and stuff like that. I had an arrangement like that and fallen apart because I did something stupid. But um, it was when I was there uh, that I was asked to take the photos for a dolphin book that a woman was writing about the dolphins in this park south of town. Well, Florida man. And the first time I went down there, I thought, I'm just, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the like so I just go see what's going on. And I know that if I take my camera, I'm gonna be seeing everything through the viewfinder. So I won't be in touch with the people. So I'm gonna leave the camera here. I went down there to introduce the photographer and the head dog and trainer and shaking my hand said, You're a photographer, where's your camera? I had to explain to him why I left it on the shelf. They had, they, the woman had already published one book about dolphins, a children's book, and she had a New York photographer who did, you know, swimsuit covers and National Geographic to shoot the dolphins. He couldn't get in the water before. He was scared of the dolphins. He liked sharks. Sharks were his friend. But he wouldn't get in the water with the dolphins. So that was my introduction to. Uh, Dolly the Dolphin and her, uh, her mates. And uh, things went from there. Uh, before we uh, get into that episode, I just want to backtrack a, a, on a few yeah. things. Um, uh, so um, let me just ask about, uh, since a lot of what uh, transpires later in your life tends towards the more spiritual, um, what, uh, what are your views on religion? What religion were you raised in, if any, and... Uh, you know, how has that affected your life? Hmm. My parents were both agnostics. My mother had been raised as a said Roman Catholic and the church had seriously worked through the, the sexual oppression, the hypocrisy, just the whole grimness of it, you know. My dad's family were Jewish, but I don't, know, I don't think they practiced for a couple of generations. Uh, so they were uh, Jewish, like us, in the intellectual tradition, uh -huh. and uh, they sort of canceled each other out. They were both agnostic. Uh, they both said, "Well, you know, you should learn about religions. You should respect all religions, and uh, um, but you know, you don't have to do what you want." My sister went to an Episcopalian church for a while, there. and for a year and a half, they sent me to the Episcopal Academy. Now, my mother didn't send me there because she wanted me to become an Episcopalian. She sent me there because it was a smart, she thought smart boys went to school there. And I was a smart boy. The fact that, you know, it was an all boys school and there wasn't any girls there hampered my development, I think, but that didn't occur to her. Um, the, the fact was the kids that went there weren't any smarter than the kids in public school. It's just that their parents had more money. After a year and a half, I begged her to let me go back to public school, and she said I could, but then my parents broke up and we went to Florida, so I ended up going back to public school, and it's not the one I thought I would. Um, you know, I read a lot of, I, I, was, I actually was afraid of God when I was a kid. I was afraid of seeing God's face in the sky, if you uh, think about it. I brooded a lot about, about God and the devil and but I had, you know, terrifying nightmares, too. I was very afraid as a kid. I was scared of everything because of the abuse I was facing. Uh, but my parents didn't figure that out. They kept sending me back to their guns. And uh, so I think 
I think I grew up very confused about God and sort of believing in a hippie, hippie version of Cosmo, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, didn't, uh, well, didn't really invest in religion happily, I guess, until I met my first wife, which was around 1980. And uh, she was uh, a witch and introduced me to witchcraft. Um, let me just uh, ask then about, uh, before we get uh, into the early 70s, um, so growing up as a teenager, uh, were you into sex, drugs, rock and roll? Uh, were you out, uh, you know, going to, uh, uh, you know, love fests, uh, where, you know, love inns or whatnot? Uh, I think I was a good boy. Mm -hmm. My brother was kind of wild, but younger, my younger brother. Uh -huh. He was uh, smoking pot and all, and dropping acid and stuff like that. When my, he made a mistake of telling me that he just dropped some acid on the way to the, I was taking him to a conference. I mean, like a comp, yeah. A band, you know. And uh, I turned around and took him home. I wasn't for God at that point. Um, no, I know. Uh, it was a dutiful son. I thought to help her mother. I remember typing papers for her. She was trying to uh, get her bachelor's degree, get an education, make something of herself. Uh, and so she said she was going to college, up in Vermont, on an adult degree program. So uh, I was, I was a good brother. So. Uh I want to just, uh, for people watching this, I may have lost a segment, that, uh, 20 or so minutes uh, with, with Malcolm where we're talking. So I'm going to uh, recap some of the things we were talking about. Um, so we had left off in the late 60s. We had talked about uh, Orgone. Uh, you had mentioned the Dolly the Dolphin episode. And uh, you'd also uh, talked about uh, uh, the abuse uh, in, in your family. So we had been talking in the segment that hopefully uh, I can recover uh, about uh, uh, Dolly the Dolphin and uh, zoophilia. Um, and I, I, I want to just uh, recap some of the things uh, that we talked about. You had talked about uh, having some attraction to other animals uh, around the same size, some dogs, uh, Dolly the Dolphin. We had uh, just been talking about uh, 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 some of the consonances of dolphins as being the top uh, most intelligent animals in uh, the aquatic sphere and human beings, uh, terrestrial. We talked a little bit about the aquatic ape theory. Um, uh, so uh, just uh, let's. Well, Richard, you just you just uh, yeah. recited it all, so yeah. we don't have to go over it now. No, but uh, I do want to get uh, some of uh, your uh, your thoughts sure. about uh, Dolly the dolphin again. So um, uh, you had t uh, I, I, one of the things you had mentioned was telepathy, and I wanted to get to talk about that. Uh, if you can uh, again talk about uh, your telepathic connection. Uh, with Dolly? Well, one of the things that makes dolphins interesting is they're not just intelligent, they're self aware. So yeah. a dolphin looking in the mirror, seeing itself, knows it's seeing itself, and not another dolphin. Yeah. Cats, dogs, most birds are put in front of a mirror. They don't make anything of it, or a bird will even attack its own animal. Not so. Dolphins, dolphins pass the self-recognition test. So they're different in that way. And uh, apparently, uh, based on my experience and that of other dolphin trainers, some of whom have published their results, they can, if they want to, get into your head and uh, sort of rummage around in there and see what they can find. I had this experience uh, happened to me a couple of times before I knew it was Dolly trying to communicate with me. Uh, the first time I was uh, trying to roll a joint under difficult conditions. It was night, it was dark. Uh, we were out of park in, uh, uh, on Siesta Key, Sarasota, Pearl Beach. The wind was blowing. It was uh, difficult to roll the papers. And the wind was blowing the pot right off the papers. And suddenly, I, I seemed to see my hands as if an outside observer was seeing somebody who was unfamiliar with hands. That was odd. 
and as if they were the, the closest things being could uh, this observer could liken to his crest. And uh, they were engaged in trying to roll up this, this fibrous white paper around this fur for, you know, some kind of benefit. And then uh, there was sort of a pop and the, uh, the fantasy disappeared and I had this well joint in my hands when winning a beauty contest with these things. I hadn't had anything to uh, smoke up to that point in the night, by the way. I was not high. I got high with my friend and on the way home, um, left and drove me in the car, I had again this uh, it was, it's the sensation of, of another thoughts in my mind that were not mine. They were they were alien thoughts. They were not hostile. They were kind of puzzled and uh, amazed at the technology around me. Uh, but that was my introduction to uh, Dolly the Dolphin, although I didn't know it at the time. She was getting into my head and uh, finding out things about the human world that dolphins apparently hadn't known before. Yeah. Um, you use the term alien, and uh, uh, you did write another book uh, called Melchior and Interstellar Affair. Um, uh, talk about that book and how it relates to Dolly. Was, was that, uh, is this about uh, uh, an alien visitation from extraterrestrials? And do you, because, because one could make an argument that a dolphin could be considered an alien intelligence compared to a human being. I think a good case can be made that dolphins are a uh, non-human person. Mm -hmm. And of all the qualifications for person from the we, they recognize themselves as a mirror, they name themselves, they apparently have something that passes for language, or uh, they use tools. Uh, you know, what else, how much, what they don't have is opposable thumbs, yeah. and uh, they don't use fire or metal. Uh -huh. So, should that disqualify them from personhood? I don't think it should. I think personhood is a reflection of how you think and how you, you, you see yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing I'll point out is dolphins can change consciousness in a heartbeat. They have to be able to. This was, this was one of the uh, things about them that I think John really, really got interested in. Uh, they can change the, the, the consciousness that you need to be swimming around at the surface. is not the same consciousness you need when you dive to a thousand feet. The pressure on your body is 450 pounds per square inch. Your lungs collapse into your chest cavity. There's no light. And things live down there that can eat you for breakfast. Like squid, killer whales, I don't know. You know. But, uh, the dolphin takes about maybe two minutes to go from that surface to a thousand feet. And it comes right back up the same way, holding its breath the whole time. How would they do that? Just that has got to be an astonishing change of consciousness way to take And to them, it's, it's as natural as breathing is to us. Remember, Dolphins don't even breathe naturally like we do. If the dolphin goes unconscious, it stops breathing. It doesn't have a breathing reflex. Uh, it needs another dolphin around or you mean to keep it at the surface and, uh, you know, pump its chest and get it restarted. Hmm. Uh, that's eventually what, what happened to Dolly. She was in a pool by herself, about the size of a bathtub. Uh, she'd been there for a couple of months. She was getting desperate. And uh, one day her trainer just came out and said he found her at the bottom of the pool without a mark on her. He suspected she committed suicide. By just not breathing? Yeah, just hold your breath until you go unconscious. We will start breathing again. Oh. Uh, I had mentioned in uh, the earlier segment that maybe, uh, maybe had been lost about uh, the aquatic ape uh, hypothesis of Elaine Morgan. And uh, you had mentioned something similar in that uh, uh, segment about uh, uh, dolphins possibly uh, having uh, maybe taught uh, uh, human beings uh, some things. Uh, could you go back into that? Uh, uh, just uh, well, even no. if even if it's just uh, 
the the intellectual connection between dolphins and humans? Uh, well, as I pointed out, dolphins have been in the current form, bottom-nosed dolphins, for about 12 million years. They've been swimming in the oceans, chatting with each other, making baby dolphins and all this stuff for, for 12 million years in the current form. Humans have had their current form for maybe 200,000 years mm. as homo sapiens, and maybe as homo erectus for like 2 million years. But that's, you know, a blink in the eye. Dolphins have far more experience living on this planet than we do. So since they have been, you know, since they are a tool-using species, they, they use primitive tools, but they use them all. It, it just seemed likely to me that if humans were, as Elaine Morgan hypothesizes, uh, an ape dwelling on the seashore for a period of our time, then that would explain a lot. It would explain why dolphins are fond of us, for one thing, they currently are. Uh, they've seen us grow up from tree trees. And the other thing is, it occurred to me that uh, if dolphins were using tools back then, as they are today, maybe they taught us to use tools. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is, Adolf Frohn, the world's first commercial dolphin trainer at uh, Marine Land in St. Augustine, Huh. He didn't teach the dolphins anything. One night, a dolphin was seen throwing a pelican feather at Frum. Hmm. The dolphin would just keep doing this over and over again, throwing the boat back in the pool. Suddenly, he realized the dolphin could be trained. Hmm. <laughs> but the dolphin had to teach him that it could be trained. Hmm. <laughs> That's the way dolphins are. You have to underestimate them at your peril. Um, let me just talk uh, and to, to go back before we move on from uh, the Dolly episode uh, in your life. Um, uh, earlier, we had uh, you had been speaking about uh, the idea that you had thought that Dolly had been not necessarily aggressive, but had been the aggressor in the sexual aspect of your relationship with her. Do you think that you have been a passive person generally? Because you spoke about your own abuse uh, as a child. I don't know if that was just sexual or was it just uh, emotional, verbal, uh, or physical. But uh, do you think that... Everything uh, but physical. Everything but physical. Uh, so uh, do you think that uh, you were, in a sense, more pliable to the idea of Dolly's, if you want to say, advances? No other girls were coming on to me. <laughs> there was one girl in high school who admitted to me many years later that she had a crush on me, but she couldn't tell me at the time. Um, yeah, frankly, it was flattering. It was flattering uh, to be paid attention to in that way after a while. You see, at first, people don't understand this. I knew I was a zoophile. I didn't want to be a zoophile. I wanted desperately to be normal. And I was trying very hard to be normal, going out with girls and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And this dolphin comes along, and she seems to see that although I'm playing normal, I'm really not. And uh, I sincerely believe that she figured out that I could be a research subject for her. I, I explained to you before that uh, as, as far as the, the, the situation that best answers all my questions, at least, is if she was a type of dolphin scientist who was trying to research why human beings are so sexually hung up. Dolphins, as, as the late Ken Norris said, uh, have sex the way human beings shake hands. Mm -hmm. That uh, Dolly may have been a puzzle, as many dolphins apparently are, about why. Yeah. yeah, we had talked about uh, uh, in the other segment about uh, uh, dolphins uh, being being highly sexualized as a humans, and I had mentioned a video about uh, dolphins uh, harassing and trying to rape a porpoise uh, a few years ago. That was a uh, an internet sensation. But uh, let me so let's move on to the mid. I, I, I will neither apologize nor explain for the reason. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let's move on to the mid to late seventies. So. Uh, what did you do professionally? Uh, journali journalism comes up. What Did you start writing for a newspaper or what? Um, I did a little writing for a weekly in Sarasota. Uh, I wanted to write uh, for the Daily. Mm -hmm. uh, 
friend of mine in Sotheby's who lived in town with Barbington and Bailey. But uh, I had sort of a history with them. You know, I had been in there a couple of times to apply for a job, and uh, the editor was the redneck, you know. Um, I don't think we can use you now, but uh, the team right here with this little box and give you a phone call if you can ever use it. I'd taken some photo, you know, there was a time when a photo drove into a, a car drove into a pond. I took a picture of it and gave it to them. I couldn't use it. Uh, so, um, I didn't become a, uh, a professional journalist really until I uh, moved to the Southwest and uh, just happened to fall into a job there. Literally, I was about to move out of this place on the end of a week and mm -hmm. Friday, and nothing there but me, the brood, and the dustpan telephone. Mm -hmm. I'm sweeping the floor, ready to go, and the phone rang. I mean, it was the editor of the local paper where I applied earlier that week. How soon can you get in here? We just had somebody friend. Monday, okay, great. Monday, 9 a.m. Great. I was hired. So, um, I, just looking on your Wikipedia page, was that the Farmington Times? Yeah, the Daily Times. Yeah. And so you worked there for a dozen or so years. Um, no, 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 no. I only worked there for 16 months. 14 oh, months. Oh, I'm sorry, 1992 to 94. I thought it said 82. That I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, what what else did you do uh, in terms of professionally? Uh, was it photographer? Were you a professional photographer? Or? I kicked around for a number of years before I slipped into journalism. Uh, I had a rather checkered career, shall we say? Yeah, I did photography on the side. I never. I think I was just too dysfunctional in my thinking to become a real go get it type A personality photographer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's you don't you don't have to know a lot about photography. You have to be able to schmooze well with people. And that's what I was incapable of. Uh, I don't know. I get along a lot better with uh, machines and dolphins than I do with people. Well, most dolphins. I've had, you know, dolphins that allowed to kill me. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, at, at this time you were, when, when were your two marriages, from when to when? What what years? Okay. My first wife, uh, let's see, I married her in uh, 1981. I was 30 years old. And we stayed married uh, till 1980, no, till 1994. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, early in 94, I think I got divorced from her. And a few months later, I married my second wife, a woman from Farmington. Uh, and I was married to her for six years. So uh, it was the, so, sec the second wife was the wife in Tewika? As a matter of fact, it means for me, yes. Hmm. Both wives, both wives were witches. Okay. Both the one I met in Seattle, who you might expect to find a witch. You don't expect to find a witch in Farmington, New Mexico. It's a wonder bright kind of town. Uh -huh. So, uh, what did you practice Wicca with her, or what? What was her attraction to it, uh, or was were you sort of just mildly tolerant of it? What was your relationship with the, the wives and their belief systems? Well, my first wife got me into Wicca. She introduced me to the concept. I thought it was vaguely related to Satanism or something somehow. Has nothing to do with that, of course, except in the minds of fundamentalist conservatives. Uh, and uh, the reason why I got into it was because it's very non judgmental about sexuality. Mm -hmm. The uh, part of the uh, work in Reed says all acts of love and pleasure are exposed to the gods. And I took that seriously. This was a really religion where people were not going to condemn me for my zoophilia. And in general, they didn't. Uh, so um, I accepted that. Now, my second wife, oddly enough, was the one who got me out of it. And I got out of it as our relationship was falling apart. But a big inducement, I think, was the fact that I had done and seen. 
the thing about wicked is you, without realizing, set up the conditions for the spell to be answered. The same way a Christian in making a prayer sets up the conditions for the prayer to be answered, not realizing it again. But if you come across those conditions, you'll think it's been answered, whether it was a prayer or a piece of magic, you know. Um, and uh, it, will, it will seem to fit. So, um, I did a ritual for money, and I got a call on the phone from Time Magazine. They called and asked uh, me to go and take a picture of an Indian Uranian protester, and they paid me 400 bucks. And I thought, this is amazing. And then I realized you can't do the same ritual twice. There's too many variables. Mm -hmm. Something is going to be different every time you do it. So you can't ever test it. It's not, as the scientists say, falsifiable. And uh, all the connections are in your mind. If you think that, you know, there's any real connection between the ritual you've done and the results you get, uh, I just don't think you've analyzed the situation correctly. So I lost faith in it, and I found that it was just being on circle with people, it was just a bunch of silly people standing around in colorful costumes chanting arcane phrases. I got out of it. So um, let me ask you about uh, the Navajo Nation, because it says that you uh, uh, did some journalistic pieces on the American Indian Movement and Russell Means. Um, what? How did you get into that, and, and what was the result of your years? Because it looks like you spent a few years. Uh, yeah, I worked for about a year and a half for the firms and paper, and I worked for uh, the remainder of my career out there. Well, not quite. I worked a while for. Uh, I worked several years for the Gallup newspaper, the Daily, and uh, the uh, Galloping, the Galloping Defendant, we used to call it, the Gallup Independent. Mm -hmm. I know you can go to these papers and look up stuff, but you won't find me there. Uh, the first newspaper fired me for practicing my religion, which was Wake Up. They weren't allowed to do that, but they did it. And the second newspaper, um, I admittedly cold caught the publisher because he told me to kiss his ass when I asked him. Uh, when I told when I told him that there was a chain of command in the office. Uh, he said, kiss my ass and I pulled content. I wasn't fired for that. I walked out of the paper after they put somebody on pleasant charge. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I still got my unemployment compensation, though. Uh, strange story. But um, how did I get it? Well, again, it's like the story I told you. I was fired. I, I went, I, I arrived at the Navajo Nation. We were living in Shiprock. I was with a nurse who wanted to practice obstetrics in, in the Indian Health Service Hospital. So I had gone in and interviewed for this job. They didn't have anything. A week later, I got the phone call. Go to work. I'm hired as a as a reporter on the Navajo Nation. It requires living in a trailer, which was the bureau in Shiprock, staffing it, you know, 24/7, uh, being there for the people, coming into town once a week for you know meetings, and other than that, you know, shooting pictures and doing stories and looking things up and being. Uh, presence on the Navajo Nation. So, Malcolm, um, let me just turn uh, to uh, your book, Melchior, because uh, now that's listed as a novel, but uh, it, it touches upon telepathy, it touches upon uh, uh, it's on an alien contact. Uh, did, what is, was that also based upon an incident in your life? Have you ever had uh, sort of uh, what one would call a, a alien uh experience in that you saw a UFO or anything? Uh, or was this something that's purely imaginative derived from other experiences like the Dali telepathy and uh, connection? Well, that book is um, sort of a blend. Uh, there is a real experience at the core of it. I give a newspaper article. On August 2nd, 1978, a large bolide entered the atmosphere of the North Pole headed south across Canada mm -hmm. and the uh, western states. 
And uh, it was about uh, two to three meters in diameter, the Air Force says. And it exploded with the force of a small hydrogen bomb over Cheyenne, Wyoming, 15 miles out to the south. Fortunately, no damage was done. But uh, that night, a uh, young woman who was uh, sleeping in a cabin in the Rocky Mountains outside of Durango was wakened up by a strange person in a silver suit standing at the foot of her bed and uh, silently begging her for help to come with him. He took her back to uh, what was apparently a crash spaceship, like a big white egg, she said, where uh, there were two other crew members, one of whom was dead and the other of whom was severely wounded. They, the, the, the surviving uh, astronaut or alien needed her help to try to move some direct equipment on the injured alien, which she did, and uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't help him, couldn't save his life. The next day, she remembered none of this until she went for a walk in the woods uh, after dinner and uh, came upon this heated white egg. And that's really... Uh... Now, I was close to the woman who had these experiences. Uh, she was a partner of a professional friend of mine in the news business. We were sort of in competition with each other, but it was friendly competition. And he started hearing me about his wife's experiences, and I thought, well, gee, if he's not gonna, you know, investigate this, I'm going to. So, uh, whoops, sorry. Um, she said I could write it up as long as I made it a novel. So, to fictionalize it, I invented a, a small cast of characters, and I also mixed uh, some of my own experiences, and my family's experiences in the first. And uh, I think the result is a, well, what I wanted to do, you know those old 1950s novels like uh, Clifford Simak, uh, 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 um, Isaac Asimov? Yeah. Uh, they just roll along, you know, real fast, fast paced. They keep you, they keep you jumping from chapter to chapter. In contrast to both Red Goddess and uh, Orgone Box, which are kind of ponderous books to write, I wanted to write something fast, easy, and relatively light. And I think that's what I did with Melchior. So what, uh, so uh, that was written in what year? That was your latest book, Melchior? Yeah, 2015. So um, let's talk about then the last 20 or so years here, because you said that you had gotten divorced around 2000, was it? Um, uh, so, what has your life been for the last 20 years? Uh, when you look back uh, on your life, you because in researching uh, you and, and watching some of the videos that you've done and, and posted on your website, um, it, there seems to be the overall sentiment that I get from you of, of ruefulness, that somehow uh, things you feel that not that you, you were cheated out of something necessarily, well, maybe you do, but that uh, somehow the, there's something missing. I, am, am I correct in that? Or? Yeah. I wish I'd been able to keep Dolly alive. Uh -huh. How about... Um, I also kind of miss my childhood, which was uh -huh. stolen from me by Dr. Duke and my mother. But, you know... You can't hate your mother, and if you do, you're probably the worst person for it. Um, you're, you're stuck with the family you've got, you know. You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family members. Uh, you do have a daughter, though. Um, what has your daughter uh, thought about uh, the things that you've written about, and what is your relationship with her? Is it better than with your mother or your ex-wives? Oh, it's, look, I don't deserve a star. I really don't. I was not always kind to her as a father. There were some times when I was a bit impulsive and angry, but um, she has turned out to be a wonderful person. Uh, she works in the advertising industry where she is very well paid. Uh, just, just this past summer, uh, 
Well, she told me, I mean, I'm sure, you know, she came to me and she said, you know, I'm never going to get out of debt. I faced that possibility. And I said, look, what can I do to help? Because I don't have a lot of money. And she said, well, I'd rather see you in a good, secure environment where you are. I was living out in the country in a rundown 1973 trailer that was falling apart. And I had two-thirds of an acre that I couldn't keep up with. And the whole place was getting away from me. And, you know, uh, during a hurricane, it was liable to flood or uh, just blow away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized that, and I realized I shouldn't stress her. And I said, let's, let's look for another place for me to live. And almost immediately we found this place. And right up on that wall, when we looked at the house, there was a tunnel. There was a, a, a hanging of a, a, a dolphin jumping out of a bunch of shells. And I said, put an offer in on this place. Uh -huh. My real estate agent, to me, next door to her. Uh, she's, she's fond of dolphins too, not like I am. But nobody's fond of dolphins. And I, actually, I have met one other person who has had sex with a dolphin. And I believe him because he videotaped it. Yeah, yeah, that was in one of your videos. Uh, I remember reading that. Um, so now that you're approaching 70, um, what do you look forward to just writing a, a few more books about certain experiences? Well, I'd like to write a book about my experiences out on the Navajo Nation because uh, I generally think that uh, Native Americans get pretty short shrift in life. What I saw up there, the staggering poverty, the things we take for granted, like running water or electricity, a lot of homes don't have them out there. They're miles from anywhere. Uh, it's like it's like going to a third world country, except you don't have to get shocks. And I even tried to learn the language, which was fiendishly difficult. The Japanese in the last World War found that one difficult. Uh, because of the code talk, it's not a code talk. But um, I would like to write a book about there, about my experiences out there, but only if I can do so without appearing to be patronizing or appearing to uh, appropriate the Navajo's culture. Uh, I don't think I did. I think one of the reasons people enjoyed me out there was because I didn't have an agenda. I didn't come out there to teach them. I didn't come out there to convert them. I didn't come out there to make them like Uncle Sam. I just came out there to see what was going on. And that's the same attitude I approached the dolphin with. I wasn't a dolphin trainer. I wasn't trying to teach the dolphin to drop through a hoop. Or, you know, I never, I never did any training except for one experience where... Uh, I wanted to get the dolphins repeating, and uh, every time she would make a sound, I'd throw the ball. I had a rubber ball, mm -hmm. and then the dolphin would go fetch it and throw it back to me. And uh, at first, she was just giving me one particular sound in response, but suddenly she seemed to catch on, and then I began to shape her sound. And then uh, when I had her saying her name, Suddenly, it was weird. She took over the game and began somehow asking me to repeat her. And she shaped my sound until I was making the same sound that she had been making in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Then she got all excited and went splashing around the pool, throwing water everywhere. I thought I was training her. No. She was training me. Uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, your inner world, your inner life, because we've talked about the, the sort of milestones or the, the, the hash marks uh, that uh, are your li life lived. Um, but before I do that, I just want to mention, in, in case you're interested, the interview right before this one that I did was with a presidential candidate named Mark Charles, who's a Navajo and he's running for president as an independent, so you might want to check that out if you get a chance. Um, but because uh, he taught, he goes into he goes into some detail about uh, the Navajo Nation. But anyway, um, 
so now here uh, in your late 60s, um, let me talk about your in, inner world and your belief systems. Uh, what fundamentally have you uh, changed in your, the way you approach the world, or the way you approach people, your ideas about spirituality, or are you a, a materialist? If, if you can look at the overall arc from your childhood through your early and mid-adulthood to now as, as you head uh, into your senior years, um, uh, is, is there any trends that you notice? Uh, are you more open? Are you more skeptical? What? Much more in control of my life, and I'm dang glad of it. I didn't even realize I could take control of my life when I was younger. The control I was about 28, uh, found myself washed up penniless in Seattle. Mm -hmm. I had gone out there to uh, make a documentary film about killer whales with a uh, friend of mine who turned out to be not so friendly. Um, I know what he is. Yeah, you know, I'm living, it, it's nice just to be able to tell people to fuck off if I don't want to deal with them, you know? Yeah. Uh, it is. And, uh, I don't hesitate to do that if I have to, but I just don't feel stressed as much as I used to. The, the interesting thing is I was depressed all my life, all my life. I thought I had psychiatric problems. Well, I did, but I also had purely chemical problems because I found an antidepressant that completely treats my depression. And I've been on it for 15 years, and I haven't experienced a major episode of depression the way I used to. Mm -hmm. So these people who are suspicious or hostile to work for pharmaceutical companies, I think that may be misplaced. And uh, years, you know, these pills did for me as of years, years of my parents throwing money at psychotherapists didn't do. Um, since you have a, a more scientific approach, it seems, to uh, life, uh, one of the things, uh, I, I did a show a, a year or two ago on narcissism, sociopathy, and psychopathy, and uh, I, some people believe, for example, that uh, sociopaths are actually, and it's an evolutionary uh, adaptation that some individuals have stumbled upon. Uh, uh, and being able to divorce themselves from their emotional sides uh, might be have an evolutionary advantage. Do you? It, it seems to me that uh, a lot of your, I guess, I wouldn't say the word empathy. Uh, I'm trying to think of what a, a better word would be. But uh, do you do you find that your maybe openness towards different ideas uh, is something that? Uh, individually may have harmed you, but that is something that humanity might need to evolve to. In other words, do you think that uh, some of the things that you have thought or believed or written about in terms of uh, openness to things, whether it's zoophilia or different spiritual atti attitudes, uh, are something that is in the future of mankind rather than just being an odd little U-turn that you yourself have taken? If we not change our ways in a radical manner, pretty soon, we're fucked. All human race is fucked. This house, this, this, this civilization we've erected is going to fall down like a house of cards. And I estimate that maybe I don't know, something between one and ten percent of us will survive that. Good luck rebuilding the civilization. It's much too complicated. Mm -hmm. I just wish, I just wish we as a species would grow up and realize that we are the only ones who care about our future. Maybe the dolphins care a little bit too because they help us when we're drowning or attacked by sharks. But uh, we can't depend on them. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed with the world I'm leaving my daughter, frankly. I 
We wanted to leave for a much better place. I just didn't know how and didn't do the uh, the appropriate things back then. And my science, I should mention, is tempered with a healthy dose of skepticism. I've had my run-ins with scientists, as you can imagine. Uh, I've had, you know, some events happen to me that I can't explain. I'm just a dog from the vet. But for instance, um, there was a day when my daughter and I, uh, I was living in Portland in a studio apartment. Uh, we came home for what had been a rather stressful day with my girlfriend. And uh, we had been angry with each other. And my daughter was standing in the kitchen about three feet away from me. All the windows of this apartment were shut. The doors were shut. And I saw out of the corner of my eyes, something looked like a black scrap of rag, a creep paper, flutter for a second in the air. And when I turned and looked at it, it was gone. My daughter was looking at me. She was about six, I guess. The terrified look on her face. And she said, Daddy, did you just see a black bird fly through the room? And I said, yes, honey, I did. I saw something like that. And she was really scared that I had to sit down and explain to her, I don't know what it is, but we're both here, we're both fine. And, you know, I don't know what it was, but it doesn't mean we didn't see it. That's not to it. We both saw it. I have no idea what it was. Scrap of a plasm or something? I don't know. The reason I ask is because uh, my next interview is going to be... Uh, or two interviews, two or three interviews from now, I'm going to be interviewing a fellow who is uh, looking at the, the UFO experience, the various uh, people who've had, had experiences seeing or claiming to be abducted by UFO occupants. And uh, he he believes that it's akin to, to the way religious belief has been uh, uh, built up over the eons. And I know that I've had what some might would call, uh, I don't guess you call uh, paranormal extra uh, or paranormal or supernatural kind of experiences. I, I, however, am basically a materialist, and I know, I know, for example, uh, there are people who, who have had near-death experiences where they claim to see things. And I think, I think that, for me, that a lot of the things that people uh, would term as paranormal or supernatural is really just their creative aspects not having a handle on that. I'm a writer. I know how to corral my imagination and and for example, I'm working on, on these five plays that redo the Camelot mythos uh, of King Arthur. But uh, I think most people, since they don't have that, when they have these, when they sort of stumble into these moments, like you just said about your daughter and you seeing this black thing, whether it was a bird-like or an apparition or something, uh, uh, that they don't know how to corral. What, do you believe that there's some kind of innate uh, Oh, I guess creative or demiurgic force uh, in humanity that we haven't corralled yet, and that a lot of the things that we uh, mistake uh, for the supernatural or the religious experience is really just something that we don't know about ourselves as humans? Well, the second part of your question, yeah, I think it's obvious. I don't think anything is just outside nature, and, uh, you know. Uh, the Italian scientist Valenzani, who lived in the 15th century, I think, was driven crazy because he discovered that bats could fly around in total darkness without seeing. He covered their eyes uh, and they could still fly. And then he uh, put wax in their ears and they couldn't fly. But when he put little Seeing trumpets in their ears, open up both ends, they could fly. So bats were listening, they could listen in the dark and they could hear obstacles, but he couldn't hear any sound the bats were making because he didn't know about ultrasound. Mm -hmm. So you can discover something that hundreds of years ahead of your time. The, the uh, guy who uh, discovered uh, the dolphins have so long didn't write it up because it was right before World War II. And he knew damn well that every major nation going to war was working on sonar systems and didn't want to give the enemy any help. Mm. 
So the dolphin sonar didn't get recognized until after World War II. Uh, let me uh, uh, sort of wrap up the interview here. Uh, I know that in uh, some of the pieces I've seen of, of you online, also I think in maybe it was in one of your videos, you had talked or, or, or you've written uh, about uh, uh, an anger uh, in dealing with some people that you feel I think sort of exploited you or exploited uh, your 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 experiences, whether it was with Dolly or otherwise. Um, could you just talk about uh, maybe, uh, without it mentioning any names or any specifics, um, uh, is that a correct assessment? Do you feel that you ha you and your life had been sort of uh, used for sort of ulterior purposes by some? Oh yeah, I expected a great deal of this because uh, I knew that if I came out of the closet about being involved in love with by the way, I made love with that dolphin. I didn't have sex with her. The guy who made the movie, the dolphin lover, just I think might be a little more precise because it was in one of the very phrase, but. Uh, it's a very like Victorian that. phrase. Hmm? It's a very Victorian phrase. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question again? Uh, do you feel that uh, people have exploited you in, in essence? Yes, yes, I feel that uh, Howard Stern, uh -huh. the interview with him was just horrible. Uh -huh. yeah, he wanted to make fun of me, but of me he, uh, you know, uh, would you wander around sex with a giraffe or a horse? I, mean, uh, gee, I think I need a giraffe, a ladder from a giraffe, Howard, but he did a horse on that one. Uh, he, I don't think he took me seriously. I don't think Bob of the Love Sponge, who interviewed me in 2011, took me seriously either, although that went on for 27 minutes. Uh, that was the only interview that I've gotten in trouble over, by the way. I experienced a, a Bob of the Love Sponge. Uh, after his interview, I experienced a dedicated denial of service attack on my, uh, my home phone, my cell phone, and my website. A huh. different website at the time. And, uh, you know, nobody's ever done anything like that. But, uh, I don't think I expected the raw hatred of people who, you know, think they know me based on one experience out of my whole life. Or the people who say that I'm an advocate for zoophilia. I've never said anything in favor of zoophilia. Frankly, you know, if I could be something else, I would, but I can't be anything other than what I am. Mm -hmm. Don't hate me for it. You can't be anything. If, if you think it's that easy to change your sexuality, try it sometime. Try getting hot over a person of the same sex if you're not gay. Mm -hmm. Or if you are gay, try getting hot over somebody the opposite sex. But I don't have that many problems with very gay people. It's, it's usually the judgment of people who are rigid in there and conservative in their thinking. So, uh, as, as you uh, head into your 70s in a, in a couple of years, so what, what do you want uh, your legacy, if one uh, wants to say, to be uh, as someone who has written about or, or, or talked about experiences that other people have not? Uh, uh, is it opening other people's minds? Uh, what What is the if the one or two things that you'd like uh, people to say, ah, you know, 50 years now, Malcolm J. Brenner, he was that guy who blank. I would like it if there are simply people could just acknowledge that there's another species on this earth that is wise enough to appreciate us and uh, if we treat them as they deserve to be treated, we might learn something from them instead of teaching them stupid tricks like jumping through hoops. We might actually learn, because they have a good record of survival on this planet, folks. They have been here a lot longer than us. They have seen staggering changes to this world, meteor impacts, ice ages, volcanic eruptions under the sea. 
We may know what to unidentified submerged objects are. Mm -hmm. We may know if, if, if extraterrestrials are making cities on the seabed, you know? Uh, and I would like to get to the mystery of why dolphins are telepathic with humans to begin with. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? But I don't think I'll, I'll hit it in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to, my legacy to be in 2050, and I'm 99. The oceans are cleaned up. And the dolphins have a safe place to live, where they can eat the fish without fear of mercury poisoning, or PCBs, or oil, you know? Mm -hmm. That would be nice. And if no child could ever go through what I went through, because their parents believe something that is clearly bullshit, that would be great too, but I don't expect that to happen. I think maybe though, if we do, if we do decide to save the planet, we will clean up the ocean. And we will, we will find out what's going on with the dolphins because I feel like we're missing half the action. This planet is seven covered seventy percent with water. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we, you can you can see stars that are millions of light years away, but your eyes can't penetrate six feet into the water mm -hmm. if it's murky. Dolphins are at home there, and they know everything about the ocean. Well, com is your website. I'll link to that below this video, as well as your Wikipedia page and uh, your Amazon page for your books. Uh, I want to thank you for spending uh, uh, well over an hour speaking. Hopefully, I'll be able to rescue that segment that uh, I seem to have had lost some power on. But uh, uh, even so, it was a, a very good and uh, fascinating interview. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Dan. I really appreciate um, the expanse of the interview and the fact that you seem to uh, want to know more about me than, you know, that I slept with the fishes back in 1970. Well, right. if I wanted to talk to someone about sleeping with the fishes, I'd dig up Jimmy Hoffa, but thanks again. <laughs> yeah, well, <it> <laughs> Okay.